Karan Agdus is here. Karan Agdus and Kundan Kumar. So we are the class in charges. Okay, I have a little bit of a good news to share, but let everybody else come in and then I'll share that bit of good news. So. Okay, everybody is coming. 26 so far. And what others? And Gatyal, Gatbyal. So I need to change my spectacles. And Sharma. Section C has got 38 boys. Okay. Thirty-eight. Yeah, I'm seeing thirty-one. Thirty-one. So a few more has to come in. I think thirty-three, thirty-five. We are already recording. So that should be the case. Anyway, we can start. And then Kumar Sharma. Section C. Yeah. Today, what we are going to deal with, we will continue our subject on description of, I think I will put my camera on also so you can see me, not that it is so important to see me, I would rather you see the plates. Okay, we have 32 boys, maybe one or two more will come in. So, so what we are going to discuss today is all the various parts of the engine. And your syllabus is very scanty in the sense they have not given what specifics are to be actually told or instructed to you. So, but I have taken the initiative of actually putting up some details which are necessary for you in the event of you ever being questioned on the subject matter. So, you need to know a little more than what your subject has given you briefly. Describe a cylinder cover. Oh, a cylinder cover is like this and it is like this. You need to know a little more than that because you need to know what material it is, why it is designed the way it is designed, what are the weaknesses, what are the areas of failure, things like that. So I have added that kind of information. One thing to make it a little interesting, otherwise it becomes a very boring subject. Cylinder cover, oh, it's a cover. You no, know, need to know what is that cover about? What is it made of? Why it is made of, of that particular material? So these are the areas which I am going to harp on. And also I will try to address any questions or any doubts that you have within you. There have been a lot of questions in the previous section. The previous section was section E. They had a lot of questions and they were very, very interested in this particular area of the subject. And I put some questions to them and they were all eager to answer those questions. Never mind if you make a mistake. Whatever mistake you make is only during these discussions. Where you must not make a mistake is in the examination or in the Viva Bose tests. In the Viva Bose tests. So that is why I want you to ask questions and clear any doubt that you happen to have. All right. So let's start with the first part. The first part and a little bit of a recollection of what we did last time. A little bit of a recollection the last time. In last we were on tie rods, if I remember correctly. And that last part we did it a little fast. We finished because time was getting over and we tried to finish it. So the tie rod purpose in an engine is to keep the entablature, A-frame and the bed plate compressed together. 
the cylinder cover doesn't come into the picture when the tie rod is concerned but the cylinder cover is also put on top of the entablature and it is held by studs which are fitted on the entablature and this entablature is ultimately under tensile stress sorry oh okay, this is why i want to follow to come a little in time um 37 38 oh you are almost 100% very good kunban kumar i think you have your job has reduced considerably same for paran agdus we have yes sir uh oh no it should be 40 because two are for me so sir, two more left sir. sorry sir two more sir. are there sir. okay yes. two more are left never mind we'll see at the end of the class you keep track and section e i had 100% attendance i was very happy about it and i think i had nothing no extra work to fill in all the absentee names or the records so it was a nice thing to happen and besides that <clears throat> i want to make it as interesting as possible so that you are also able to absorb the subject the difficulty is you know what afternoon classes after lunch everybody is a little sleepy so that is what makes it difficult so try to stay awake and keep yourself focused and to keep you focused i am going to put some questions to you and i will want those answers in during our interaction foundation bolt on bed plate are made of which material they are made of mild steel simple mild steel all right jan that answers your question so but the tie rods they are made of forged steel and they are definitely much stronger than mild steel because the tie rods they have to last the entire life of the engine there are very rare and very few cases of tie rod failures but remember tie rods can also fail normally nobody looks at them during the entire period they are on the ship or even after contract for years and years and years but there are instances of tie rod failure i have come across foundation bolt or oh i have already answered this jant sharma mild steel huh? keep in mind so tie rods they have failed i have experienced only one time tie rod failure and this tie rod failure was largely on account of fatigue failure and i will tell you the experience it's a very interesting experience and after this i will put a question to you and you have to think out what the answer will be okay so we in it was in kolkata itself i was working in calcutta docking and engineering company we were doing ship repairs and oh by the way i have some very good news for all of you and today we got the news that 12 boys from 2017 entry batch who had appeared for the aptitude test are all through all through and now they have to go for their medicals and if their medicals are clear then all 12 will be engaged with the company so 12 which were shortlisted after the interview from about 30 boys from 30 boys 12 were shortlisted for aptitude test all 12 have cleared and all 12 have been uh, absorbed in the company now the only hurdle is their medical test and medical test what i could see was eyesight that eyesight has to be very very good they are harping on that eyesight they sent me the letter i have forwarded to the batch so they will get the eyesight done apart from seeing the eyesight they will check the color what what is called that color blindness that will also be checked so i hope all of them are clear because once you fail in a medical test then there is no hope then no matter even god cannot help you to get into a ship that is the way so that is the good part of our boys that well all 12 have got into scorpio ship management okay now let us continue with the subject we were on tie rods i had an experience of one tie rod failure and the tie rod failed at the end which means just below the threaded portion of that tie rod so we went to ship we somehow pulled it out it was not easy that is why i am going to put a question to you the tie rod from the top had sheared off so the nut and part of the tie rod had come off 
So the tie rod was flush. So how will you lift it out? So we lifted it out. There are ways we lift it out. And then we brought it to our workshop. And then we measured the tie rod and we measured that we found about three inches were extra. So we again machined the end of the tie rod and made threads on it for three inches. And then put back the nut. We loosened the nut at the bottom a little bit, pushed it up a little, and then we put the nut on top after machining the thread. And we left the ship run. But three months later, again, the uh, information came to us that the tie rod is broken again. Because <clears throat> one thing is we could not replace the tie rod. To replace a tie rod which is 30 to 40 feet long and 20 centimeters, it takes months. It takes months. And only the manufacturer of that engine will be able to produce those tie rods because they are intended for that particular engine. So you have to order it from the company which has manufactured the engine. So that would take months, six months at least. So the ship needed to sail. So we did an emergency job and then we let the ship sail. But three months later, a report came that same tie rod has again failed. That means that material had already stretched beyond its limit and it was a matter of time that it failed again. So once a component fails out of fatigue, it is to be rejected. You cannot use it again. That is why the bottom and bearing bolts of auxiliary engines have to be have to be have to be changed after a stipulated time frame given by the manufacturer. Even if the bolts look perfect after fifteen thousand hours or twenty thousand hours of running all the bottom and bearing bolts have to be changed. Have to be changed. There is no questions about it. You may take it out and you find it is perfect. But then you still have to change those bolts. Why? Because they have reached a certain permanent set. That setting is on account of the bolts reaching a certain cycle of stress and release, stress and release, stress and release. If those bolts are used more than that 20,000 hours, they are bound to break. They may look perfect, but they are subjected to so many thousand or so many million cycles of stress and release, stress and release. The same thing with the wire. If you take a piece of wire, okay, not this wire, the ordinary iron wire. If you take a piece of wire and you bend it and you bend it, you bend it and you bend it and you bend it and you bend it. After some time, what happens? It breaks. The same principle is going on to those boards. They are stretched, release, stretch, release, stretch, release, stretch. After some time, they suffer fatigue failure. So that is why tie rods are possible. It is possible for tie rods to fail under fatigue failure. Do not assume that the tie rod can last endless because they are subject to fluctuating stresses. And these stresses arise, as I told you, from the gas pressures on the piston and gas pressures under the cylinder cover. So ultimately, they fail. All right. So in continuation with our subject, let us go on to the first item that is on right on top of the engine. How did you come to know about fatigue, sir? Fatigue of what? Fatigue about the tie rod. Yes, sir, about tie rod. Yes. Okay. The tie rod is stationary. It is in one place. And once it is tensioned, we know what forces they're coming around. All right. So ultimately, they will fail over a period of time. Another way to identify a fatigue failure is to check the portion that is broken. All right. This broken portion of fatigue failure will be very, very indicative. I wish I had the sketch. It is, if you see, okay, let's, I have a torch to help you. Suppose the failure is absolutely, this is the tie rod and it has failed from here. So if you look on this end surface of the tie rod, you will find there are some gradual failure marks. So it starts from the surface. The failure starts 
from an aberration on the surface it should also start with yes, some yeah what is it sir uh, sir uh, you are not uh, sir below the camera level uh, sir uh, the torch is not visible but the oh, torch you are doing. okay okay let me see myself first Okay, now I think you can see. Now you can see better, right? Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, I had to change the angle of my uh, laptop screen. Then only others you are seeing very high. Okay, okay. Now I get it. So this this is the area of the torch which has possibly failed. So if you see the end of the torch, uh, better will be a diagram. Okay. I will just make out a simple diagram which will indicate to you how the failure has taken place. Okay. The sketch. This is a. Okay. Let me see myself so I can see. Whether you are able to see me properly or not, I think I'll keep this one on. Now that thirty-eight people are there, now have a look at this diagram very, very carefully. All right, the the arrowhead will show you which is the origin. The arrowhead shows you which is the origin of the fatigue failure, and once it fails from that tip, you will see. the breakage happens little more little more little more little more till it comes to about the mid position of the shaft and then this portion of the shaft fails instantaneously and it drops the failure could also be somewhere in the middle now if it is in the middle it looks something like this now you see something in the middle the failure if you see the original as the spot that spot possibly in the crystalline structure that particular flaw was there in the crystalline and that fails first moment that fails the next crystal will fail beside it and so on the failure will keep expanding more and more and more and more so that the cross sectional area which is supporting the whole load keeps reducing till such time at one shot the remaining part breaks off so that is how you make up a fatigue failure in a shaft this is what the appearances in that fatigue failure kartik have you been able to understand what i said it's a little difficult to understand that sir why i told you uh, this is the cross sectional area what you will see all right and the point of failure is starting from that arrowhead position and that is any minor flaw and that could be the origin of a fatigue failure same thing happens with the crankshaft if you are working inside the engine engine crankcase and the shaft which is holding the bearing is open and the bearing is removed and from your pocket a spanner drops and the spanner drops on that surface it will make a microscopic dent and that microscopic dent will possibly be the original of a fatigue failure a fatigue failure happens from a point which is weakest at that shaft and which is the weakest at that particular shaft even a microscopic dent in the shaft can become the origin so much so even in the center of the shaft in the material if there is one grain which is not adhering to the next grain properly one microscopic grain that will become the origin of a fatigue failure so that origin has to be there and from there the failure keeps expanding till it reaches the entire shaft in any case every material will fail if it is subject to a certain number of cycles and if it is subject it is called the s and n curve on that number of cycles and the extent of stress 
so that causes fatigue failure so your thyroid is also subject to fatigue failure any component which is subject to alternating stresses reversal stresses or fluctuating in the stresses is subject to potential fatigue failure all right okay let's go on to our subject as i will not move on what we are excuse me sir uh now what go ahead sir uh, you told that uh, uh, like in your personal experience the ship detected the thyroid failure 3 months after you uh, uh, repaired it and then installed it again yeah. sir, so uh, when the ship de- detected that failure what method did it employ in order to uh, you know as a makeshift procedure just to you know uh, like let's just to uh, you know carry it forward till it reaches the shore i mean like what was the replacement method that the ship undertook replacement afterwards they have to order for it and they were running on one connecting rod uh, sorry one tie rod short in fact i have a question for you and on based on that question i will give you more information how will you know that a tie rod is broken tell me how will you know a tie rod is broken can you tell me if a tie rod is broken there are say nine cylinder engine and 20 tie rods so how will you know one tie rod is broken somebody kartik sir one unit sir, sir one unit will operate at a time from the uh, where one the bolts are tightened one at a time one at a time go ahead go ahead come on tell me so we can check from where the bolts are tightened we can see if there is any dent uh, appear appearing on the top or from the bottom also see when you come into the engine i'm asking you a practical situation where you are on board the ship nobody comes to look at the tie rods every day they come check everything they assume everything and they move on so nobody how will you know the tie rod is broken Sir, will Sir, there be one... unusual vibrations? There is no vibration. That is the first thing I was waiting for. There is no vibration. I will tell you why. You look upon a truck wheel, a wheel fitted on a truck. All right. There are about six or eight studs on which the nuts are fitted to hold that wheel in place. I have seen trucks with only two nuts missing, and the truck wheel is running smoothly. Out of the eight, if two are missing. the other six are taking the load of those two and there is no vibration and is running fine similarly if in an engine if you have 20 tie rod and one tie rod is broken you will never know there is no indication no vibration nothing the only way to find it out is when you make a crankcase inspection that means engine is stop you go in the crankcase and you check everything and you will find the tie rod has dropped in the sump it is resting on the sump the whole tie rod is broken and if it is broken from the middle let us say the tie rod is so heavy that it will keep resting in its place it is not a small nut and bolt that will rattle with a little vibration it is heavy in with the engine it will move continuously you cannot make out and nobody during the watch goes and checks each tie rod every time in every watch nobody does it it is never done that is it you have to assume that it is okay and the only way to find out remember this is an mmd question how will you know so the only way to know and be absolutely sure it is broken is to see it visually that that rod has fallen in the sump and the nut is still on top all right so that is how you make out a whole tie rod is broken and replacement you have to order from the manufacturer they have a few tie rods spare but the transportation is the biggest cost and the ship if it is going somewhere near the place where the manufacturer is then it is much more advantages otherwise it will take you 3 to 6 months to get it delivered at a particular point where it can be brought on board other than that there is no scope they don't assume that every order now and then a tie rod will break so they will not make multiple tie rods and keep it in the store you have to specially order for it and possibly they will manufacture it because they have the infrastructure they have the material everything the specifications the drawings everything otherwise if they make tie rods and keep it means their money is locked 
and no but no tie rod is breaking so why will they make a spare tie rod so that is the principle behind tie rod and i had something more to ask yes now for you i have a question the question is if the tie rod is broken from the middle let us say it is broken from the middle you can remove the top part of the tie rod very easily because you can fit an eye bolt on the top and put it out in the crane how will you remove the bottom piece of the tie rod which is going through and through the a frame through the bed plate into the uh, stump of the engine so that question is with you do a little thinking while i continue with our subject others will never get ahead the question for you if a tie rod is broken from the middle how will you remove it from the engine okay let's move on let's talk about cylinder covers these are the top most fittings and this forms the top part of the cylinder space cylinder combustion space that is and must be of sufficient strength to withstand the gas pressure loads at peak pressure obviously the maximum pressure happens at peak pressure these cylinder covers are mostly made of cast steel and in some cases they are still cast iron all right cast steel is definitely much more strong than your cast iron okay the cylinder cover when it is sheeted it lands on top of the flange of the liner you see the cylinder liner is a cylinder and at the top it has got a flange all right so when the cylinder liner is fitted in the entablature it rests on that flange all right and on top of this flange again the cylinder cover seat rests on it so the flange actually is sandwiched between the cylinder cover and the entablature okay so that is how gas tightness is achieved in the combustion chamber in fact some of them will also use a gasket between the cylinder cover and the cylinder liner but those are for small engines for the larger engines gaskets are never used we've had an experience where the gasket is to continuously fail and the gasket was made of mild steel it is to simply burn out you cannot afford to have mild steel over there you have to have something of much higher grade of steel to combat the gas temperatures mild steel cannot okay um the the cover lands on the cylinder liner flange that is headphones what is this okay sorry let's go to the chat just in case one say oh there are questions here okay what are the questions that is how do you know about fitting sir oh, that i told you madhav jha says sir we cut the tie rod from the bottom as far as possible and the remaining rod can we bring down uh, uh, not so simple is not so simple how much can you cut the tie rod is say 40 feet and it breaks from 20 feet so it is 20 feet inside the engine so you can cut only 6 inches at the bottom and each tie rod is 15 to 20 cm diameter and inside the crankcase you have oil so what are you going to cut it with with axe you spend your entire career cutting that piece of iron your whole career will be spent sitting in the crankcase and cutting the gear okay can we remove the tie rod by cutting or by somehow lifting from the bottom what is this somehow lifting you have to be you are an engineer you are supposed to give very very specific details in the procedure of removing the tie rod step by step sir like is somehow removing like we have the, uh, what like we have jacks for lifting up the car like that so, something uh, if I, how many jacks you have to lift it more than 40 feet or even at least 21 feet how will you lift it up 20, through the passage of the bed plate through the passage of the uh, a frame and through the passage of the entablature and the entablature diameter to which the uh, tie rod goes is probably uh, 22 cm and the diameter of the rod is 20 cm so there is no space to put anything between so do a little more thinking employ hydraulic pressure to the bottom part of the head thread 
thyroid paran then you will get all the hydraulic oil coming out from the top because there is a clearance between the thyroid and the hole through which the thyroid goes so all the oil will come up from the side and you will flood the engine with the thyroid with the oil do more thinking no, don't stick to thyroid pay attention to still in the head at the end of the class we'll again discuss because, because we have to finish the other part of the subject also all right so don't ask anything about thyroid now you will get back to it do more thinking it is not so simple a broken thyroid removal is one of the more difficult tasks but it is for you to do some thinking so where were we the cover lands on the cylinder line of flange i hope that everybody understands it is held in place by studs on the entablature that means on the entablature you will have studs and those studs are what holds the cylinder cover down tie bolts do not directly hold the cylinder cover in place i know you have understood it but i am repeating it because the previous semester previous batches have always made this mistake that the tie rod holds the cylinder cover entablature a frame and bed plate together so i have to give them zero the question is what is the purpose of tie rods and they say it helps the cylinder cover entablature a frame and bed plate together so i have no choice but to give them zero so that is why i have repeated that sentence tie bolts do not directly hold the cylinder cover in place okay now who's come i thought you are 100% attendance outside it headquarter who is azaruddin not cricketer no okay let him join hey what is this somebody else has come again nazir mohit hey what are you fellows doing going out and in i will not this disturbs the class very much you know you know the tie rod or passing down a ride rod or wire down the tie <laughs> there's no clearance between the tie rod and the this is like a sleeve thin sleeve and then wire you are going to lift one ton with a wire is a wire no 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 Sorry, man. Let's leave it. Let's move ahead with our subject. So, tie. Everybody has understood uh, that tie bolts do not hold the cylinder cover in place. Go and make that mistake. If you make that mistake now, since I have told you repeatedly, I will give you negative marking in the next exam. The cylinder cover also supports various mountings. Now, this is very important. The cylinder cover is right on top of the engine. Now, on the cylinder cover, you have various mountings. mountings are you know fittings which help in the operation and running of the engine so first one i have said there are four common mountings whether it is for four stroke whether it is for two stroke the common mountings are air starting valve fuel injector relief valve and indicator cock air starting valve is used to start the engine air is compressed and pumped into the engine when the piston is just after tdc and then when it pushes the piston down it gets to rotate the flywheel and that flywheel stores some energy to continue the rotation for the next unit to cause the compression and thereby rise in temperature and thereby injection of fuel takes place and firing starts so air starting valve is necessary to regulate that air into that cylinder it must also stop when the piston has reached its bdc doesn't make sense to keep sending air into the cylinder when the piston is at its bdc so air starting valve on the cylinder head is one important mounting number 2 you need to deliver fuel into the combustion spaces so a fuel injector is utilized and it is kept right in the center all right a third thing is the relief valve a relief valve is not a safety valve it is a relief valve there is a difference between a relief valve on a cylinder cover of an engine and the relief valve of a boiler the relief valve of a boiler is called a safety valve okay so why is it called safety valve and why is this called relief valve you will have to think and give me an answer all right okay i am not going to give you the answer to everything i want you to do a little searching also 
to keep you awake and keep you enthusiastic. Okay. In throwing hardy is the bottom part of the thread. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. So you got up to relieve valve. And the fourth item is called the indicator cock. Indicator cock is a valve. I think I showed you the last video on the engine. And there was an indicator cock which is fitted, and this fellow with the electronic device, he checked the pressure. And uh, upon that pressure, he could get all details about the combustion process inside that engine. So that indicator cock is used for two purposes mainly. One is to measure the conditions inside the combustion chamber while it is running. And second one, before starting the engine, to ensure that there is no water accumulated inside that chamber. Because sometimes your fuel might be leaking, so it will fill up that place. Sometimes cooling water, which is used to cool the engine, might find its way into that chamber. And when you start the engine with water inside the cylinders, and you try to compress it, the whole engine will rupture. Because hydraulic pressure is something no material can sustain up to a limit. But this goes beyond the limit, and your whole engine will rupture. If water is inside the cylinder and you start the engine. So to make sure that there is no water, you open the indicator box and turn the engine very slowly through the turning gear. So the engine rotates, or rather the crankshaft rotates and the piston comes up. So if there is any water, you will see it coming through the indicator box. So you know there is some problem. So then you take it out. Normally, nothing comes out, only air. This is one. And also, after dis disengaging the turning gear, you are required to run the engine on air for a very short while, while the indicator cocks are kept open. This also will blow out any air that is inside the cylinder. And in the process, if there is any trace of water, it will also come out from the indicator cock. So when you're trying out engine, one engineer expected to keep his eye open on the all the indicator cocks to notice what is coming out of that? If only air comes out, everything is fine. All right. So these are the four. One sec. Khalid has got a question. A really valve boiler is used when the pressure inside the boil goes above the safe pressure. So that is why it is called a safety valve. It is not called a relief valve. All right. The same thing happens for your cylinder. So, but why is this called a relief valve? And that is called a safety valve. Why can't that be called a relief valve? That is also giving relief. Madam, think a little more. The safety valve acts as a switch. And a relief valve can be used as a controllable. How do you use it as a controllable? No, no, that's no good. No good, Madam. We have to do better than this. Okay, so let's go ahead. Air starting valve, fuel injector, relief valve, indicator valve. Four. Apart from these four, sometimes in two-stroke engine, you have an exhaust valve fitted on the top. So this exhaust valve will also become a mounting. That is the fifth mounting in the two-stroke engine. Remember, five mountings on the two-stroke engine. In the four-stroke engine, matters are a little different. And that difference is because Oh, for two-stroke engine, a single large centrally located exhaust valve may be fitted on the cylinder head. This along with two or three fuel injectors are sometimes installed. Not one injector, two or three. Why two or three? Again, that is a question for you, but don't answer now. We will discuss these questions at the end of the class. Otherwise, it becomes an interruption. Okay. So, in the case of a two-stroke engine, you have the four common mountings plus an exhaust valve if there is one. If you have exhaust ports, then you don't need an exhaust valve. So, you will have exhaust ports and inlet ports and no exhaust valve. So, then you will have only four mountings. In case you have only inlet ports, then you need to have an exhaust valve. And if you have an exhaust valve, <clears throat> you have five mountings. And on these engines, which has got an exhaust valve on top, sometimes you have two or three fuel injectors. All right. 
Now, for four stroke engines, apart from those four mountings, which is air starting valve, fuel injector, relief valve, and indicator cock, apart from these four, there are some more mountings. And these are the inlet outlet valves, their springs, their guides, and the rocker arm which operates these valves. All these are mounted on the cylinder head. So that is why they can be called mountings on the cylinder head. All right. No mistakes. Four stroke mounting are a little different from two stroke engine mounting. Okay. That way I say a four stroke engine, a rocker arm assembly, and inlet and out exhaust valve may also be used. And you know, this inlet and exhaust valve is not alone. It alone meaning along with the valve, oh my god. Okay. Along with the valve, you'll have springs, and along with the spring, you'll have guides. I will show you in another diagram where the guides are fitted. The guide is a cast iron guide. And this helps in very smooth action between the valve spindle and the guide. Okay. In some cases, instead of having one inlet valve and one exhaust valve, you have two of each. Two inlet valves and two exhaust valves. Okay. Why two each? See, I have told you right in the beginning. Did I tell you? Oh, we've never had a class. You know, during class sessions, these ideas come through better and your absorption is also much better. Online, the absorption is not that great because you don't really feel you're in class. But let me tell you, I normally at the beginning of any IC class, I tell them, how, how does an engine perform? It performs by breathing. As much as you do when you're running a race, you breathe a lot. And you are running fast, you breathe even faster. That means your air intake and exit has to be faster. But if you've got a choked nasal passage, you can't breathe fast. You can't take in air and discharge fast easily. So you cannot perform. To improve your performance, you need to breathe well. But we have got only one nose with two holes. An engine can be given four holes. So that two holes are for inlet and two holes are for outlet. So the cylinder cover or the cylinder bore which is there, maximum space is used for opening of the passages to the cylinder chamber or the gas ch or the combustion chamber. If you can maximize the inlet and outlet, then the rate at which the air can be changed is faster and improved. In other words, your volumetric efficiency is improved if you have four valves. Okay. Next is these cylinder covers. We are discussing cylinder covers, remember, not valves. Cylinder covers are hollow structure. They are not solid. That means there's space inside them with cooling water passing through for heat dissipation. See, as the engine keeps working, it gets hotter and hotter. We did that heat balance diagram, if you remember. Cooling water takes out so much of the heat because that heat cannot be utilized for the work. So that heat will cause the component to become or lose its properties. If it becomes very hot, what happens to steel if you keep heating it? It will become soft. It will become red hot. It will become soft. And then we get distorted. And the whole purpose is lost. You have a distorted engine. All right, so that is why these covers are made hollow and there are spaces just above the combustion chamber where the water circulates and cools the surface as quickly as possible. So the rest of the cover does not get hot. So you can touch the cylinder cover when it is running. It is about 65 or 60 degrees centigrade at the most. Why? Because lower down, it is 350 degrees centigrade. But the water in between the surface you touch and the combustion chamber removes all the heat or the heat dissipation. The modern cylinder cover employs what is called bore cooling. I think let's put this in yellow. Okay.
I can't read it only. Yeah, now it looks more presentable. See, these PowerPoint programs take a lot of time to make. And actually, they are my notes plus some additions. Because now they are new, I can make some additions. So the additions and my notes are put in a PowerPoint arrangement. So I've taken out the cream of the information and I've put it across. And instead of writing long drawn hand notes, I think this point wise notes will be more relevant to you. And if you are able to remember the points, it should not be any difficulty in answering questions in the examination. A modern cylinder cover employs bore pulley to reduce thermal stress in the combustion chamber wall. See, any wall which is heated on one side, <coughs> the temperature will rise that side faster than the other side. And that depends on how thick the wall is and what is the conductivity of that material. And what is the temperature difference between the two surfaces or the surface aside. Okay. Now, bore cooling is an arrangement where holes are drilled through the thick wall and the holes are closest to the heated surface. So, as the water goes through those holes, it removes whatever heat is being transmitted to that wall. So, before the other side can get any indication of temperature, before any temperature gradient is set up, the heat is removed. So, the component is under reduced thermal stress. Thermal stress arises when one side is very hot and other side is very cold. Okay. So, this side will expand more. This side does not expand. So, the whole thing will fracture. There is a physical force comes in and it will fracture. So, to avoid thermal stress, bore cooling is employed. Okay. So, I hope you understand what I am talking about. So, cylinder covers are subject to bore cooling. Now, here is an example of a cylinder cover of a Sulzer engine, of a Sulzer RD engine. And this particular cylinder cover does not have an exhaust valve. But the cylinder cover is in two pieces. Okay. The lower piece or the larger diameter piece is made of cast steel and that is called the cover. Okay. That forms part of the combustion chamber. What you see here is the combustion chamber. Okay. Part of the cylinder cover is also an insert. This insert is made of cast iron, which is CI. And in this cast iron insert, you have the mountings are fitted. The first one that you see on the left is called the relief valve. So this relief valve will lift and allow the exhaust gas to come in the engine room because it is only momentary. This has happened on the ships that you work in. While maneuvering, if you are manually maneuvering the engine, you could possibly give extra fuel. By giving extra fuel, the amount of the extent of explosion inside the cylinder is very large. So that the peak pressure goes above the limit and the relief valve lifts to give relief to the pressure that has built up in the combustion chamber. And for Indian engines, if I remember, it used to be 128 bar. So that pressure will lift this valve and allow that extra pressure to be released into the engine room. And once that pressure drops, the relief valve instantaneously sits back. So it's a spring-loaded valve. Besides the relief valve, what you have is the fuel injector. This fuel injector is also called a fuel valve. And this fuel valve is actually hydraulically pressurized to open. And only under hydraulic pressure it opens. And that pressure, when it passes through very narrow passages, splits into a spray. And that spray is something like when you use a Begon spray pump, what comes out as a spray or even from of these uh, sprays, big on sprays, what comes out, similar is what comes out from these fuel injectors. Though the heavy oil is heavy oil, it's thick, it's like honey, but that oil has to be heated 
to 100 degrees centigrade or more, and then it becomes very thin. And then when it is pressurized and passed through the filter, it will come out the same way as your Bagon spray pump. Same spray will come. And that helps to ignite the fuel very quickly. Okay. So, so my Besides the fuel injector, what you have is the air starting valve. This air starting valve, it has got two areas of pumping. One is the main air. You see this arrow over here on the right side. This arrow helps the air, which is the main air coming with a large diameter pipe. Paran, what are you saying? Sir, instead of drilling holes for passage of water, can we put up an extra layer of heat absorbent material? What heat absorbent material are you going to put? And after that material absorbs the heat, where is the heat going to go? It is only going to get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And then what happens? It fails. So that heat has to be discharged into the sea. Heat is energy, remember. And that energy is continuous. It can absorb the heat and keep absorbing the heat. But ultimately it has to let go of the heat. It cannot keep absorbing heat endlessly. Okay. So it has to be sent to the sea. And that is by the cooling water. The cooling water which comes, cools the cylinder cover, goes out. That cooling water which is fresh water is again cooled with sea water. So the heat is transferred from the cooling water to the sea water. And that sea water after cooling the fresh water is thrown overboard. So actually, we are discharging heat energy into the sea. All right. Because fresh water which cools the engine is again cooled by the seawater. And if it is cooled by the seawater, then the seawater will become warm. And then what do you do with that warm seawater? You can't keep it on board. You throw it out and you get fresh seawater. Seawater is endless supply. So cold seawater comes in and warm seawater goes out taking away whatever waste heat is there. You cannot have a heat absorbent material. What is heat absorbent material? But think, think it can be. If you can come up with some radical measures, so be, so be it. We don't need pumps. We don't need water. Okay. Okay. So you have the air starting valve. This air starting valve is intended to regulate the air into the combustion chamber when the piston is just past TDC, so that when the pressure on top of the piston is there, it will push the piston down and cause rotation of the crankshaft. If the air pressure is good, 30 bar, it will push very quickly. So a lot of energy from that movement is transferred to the flywheel. And the flywheel will continue to rotate so that some other unit will be going up and compressing the air, which will again reach ignition temperature, fuel will be injected, and combustion will take place. And that combustion will push that piston down. You don't need air. So once it starts the engine, the air is cut off. In fact, the air is cut off. The starting air is cut off. Moment the piston goes to the bottom dead center. Okay. So the air comes from here. It goes right up to the valve and stays here. Then the Pilot air, which operates this valve, comes from the distributor and operates the valve depending on what the position of the piston is. If the piston is at BDC, then that valve will not open. It will open only when the piston is after TDC to help the piston to be pushed down. You can't push the piston down once it's reached its BDC, can you? You can't use air to lift up the piston. You can only inject air into the next unit whose piston is near about or after TDC. Okay. So that is your cylinder cover for a Sulzer engine. And it consists of a cover which is made of cast steel and an insert which is made of cast iron. And the mountings of the engine are fitted in the insert. One mounting which is not shown here is the indicator cock and that is at a different section 
it will have one little hole in one one of these and a small hole going right on the top and the indicator cock will be right on top over here okay that will also be passing through the insert so this is your cylinder cover i don't expect you to draw this in the exam this is merely to make you understand one design of a cylinder cover there are several more and i have one of them which i have taken from a book for you to practice drawing and draw in case you are asked in the examination to sketch and describe a cylinder cover okay next what we are going to look at is cylinder cover of a four stroke engine all right let's have a look at look at the cylinder cover of a four stroke engine now this here is a cylinder cover of a four stroke engine on the left side what you see is a photograph of the cylinder on the right is a cutaway section but keep in mind this cylinder cover is not the one that is shown on the right side that right side is a different one left side is a different one they are two different cylinder cover they are not the same cylinder cover on the left side that cylinder cover that you see is actually having four valves that means two exhaust valves and two inlet valves okay notice the cylinder cover very carefully there is only one passage this side so this passage could either mean inlet inlet of air or exit of gas okay now look at the top of the cylinder cover in the center you can make out that is the place for the fuel injector the fuel injector is fitted here the rocker arm assembly is not shown but that rocker arm assembly will be quite complicated because it has got two inlet valves and two exhaust valves how do i know that these two are exhaust valves these two are inlet valves now if you see on the far end there is a rectangular open space at that side this rectangular open space is intended to pass the push rod which are operated by the camshaft to move the rocker arm to operate the valves okay so that means the push rods come from here and the camshaft will be on the far side so if the push rod is from this side then this side will be the exhaust because the scavenge manifold or the air inlet will be on this side so that is why this side will be the exhaust manifold so this here is the exhaust manifold and these two valves are the exhaust valves okay okay this hole what you see here is for outlet of the cooling water the cooling water will be coming from down below here like what you see here this is the inlet from the engine block it comes to an elbow pipe this is called an elbow pipe let's see what you said cooling water bends he has used cooling water bends but on board the ship you will more likely call it elbow pipe same thing like what you use in your in your normal plumbing elbow pipe so this is also an elbow pipe it is a bend okay now that is a photograph of a four stroke medium speed cylinder head or cylinder cover same thing and this is a cutaway picture of a two valve cylinder cover you see over here this has got only four studs to hold it in place one two three and one is four which is cut away over here you have one two three four and maybe more that side you cannot see one two three four at least five you have got here at least five one two three four and one five five studs to hold that place in place and over here you have only four three of them are visible and one has been removed apart from this you can see there is a valve here supposed to be a valve here and a valve there the valve from here has been removed and what you can see is only the guide the guide has been fitted into this recess or this place over here and this guide is specifically made of cast iron why cast iron is used we will tell you soon when we study cylinder liner for the same purpose this guide is also used cast iron so the valve over here is still there no it's not there it has been removed only the guide is there and cylinder head is there the spaces are hollow 
in this cutaway section, this hollow space is actually cooling water allowed through for cooling. Okay, so this is your cylinder cover of a four stroke engine. Now, this is the cylinder cover for a large two stroke engine with more cooling arrangement. And this is the diagram I would expect you to draw in case you are asked in the examination. Drip sketch and describe a two stroke cylinder cover. So, in this cover, bore cooling is cooling through these narrow passages. And over here, it goes right around the inlet, fuel inlet valve or fuel injector. Same thing. And then it goes out from the upper part of the fuel injector housing. So, this is your cooling water passing very close to the combustion chamber walls. All these water drilled passages, they are coming very close. In this diagram, a lot of things are missing. It's not so clear, but it has been taken from a Reed's examination book. So it is technically correct, but figuratively it seems a little odd because there is no flange of the liner shown yet. He says this is the liner, unless the liner is very thick, but the liner being very thick for all its length is impossible. Okay. Okay. So this is the cylinder cover. The cooling water enters from the elbow, yeah, from the cylinder liner cooling, it enters the cylinder cover and it goes through the entire engine and finally comes out through these uh, bores and out to the uh, upper part of the cylinder liner to remove any chances of any air bubble. Actually, you know, I also cannot make out how this damn diagram is to help in circulating the water. They have shown passages which are open to the engine room and the water is going to go in only in this direction and it comes out from here. So what happens in this part? What happens at this part? Anyway, this has been accepted by Reed's book and the diagram is will be considered. It is a, it is a conceptual diagram to indicate to you how a cylinder cover has got bore cooling arrangement. The objective is to show you that the bores are very close to the combustion chamber walls. The combustion chamber walls are all here. These are the combustion chamber walls. The combustion chamber walls are in five different parts. In other words, the combustion chamber has walls which encompass cylinder liner, cylinder cover, piston crown, exhaust valve, and little bit of the fuel injector nozzle, which is fitted right inside the combustion chamber. So these five are the constituents of the combustion chamber walls. Okay, let's go on to our next diagram. Okay, now this is a, a diagram which you may be able to draw. You can practice it if you want. And this is to show you how bore cooling is achieved in four stroke medium speed engines. Okay, let's read on it. To maintain low surface temperature in the combustion spaces, bore cooling is employed. Understandable. Oh, next is. Four valves are utilized for better breathing characteristics. Just now I explained to you how well it can breathe depends on how big your opening passage is. That means the air coming in and going out. Now instead of having one, we have got two for coming in and two for going out. All right. So four valves enable better breathing characteristics, give better gas exchange process and thereby better fuel efficiency. That means your engines will run better if you can fill it up with more air and take out what the burnt air is after combustion as quickly as possible. So that will ultimately give you a better performance of the engine and better fuel efficiency. All right. It is important to have clean filtered cooling water to ensure 
clogging of passages do not occur. Now, where bore cooling is employed on board the ship, a little more care has to be taken regarding the coolant. That means the water which is used for circulation. Now, <clears throat> more often than not, there will always be accumulation of cement, sediment inside the tank <clears throat> which is holding the cooling water. It comes from rust, from the dust, and then oxidized particles which are in the engine room. So, cooling water can get dirty. So, this dirt, if it is in large quantities, while the pump is churning the water, this dirt will travel with the cooling water and it will probably get lodged in some place, usually the bend at which there is a bend for the cooling water passing, that they get stuck over there. Once it keeps depositing over there all the sediment, then the entire passage is blocked. But no cooling water is going to pass through. And then what it was intended to, to do, that means cool the component, it will not do the opposite. It is causing overheating. That is why that cooling water used in more cooled engines need to be extraordinarily clean. Okay, so oh, this light is hurting me. I think I have to put a reduced light or I have to put a piece of paper. I put that light because now you can see me better, but it's hurting me also. Let's see what I can do about it. So reduce the light. Ah, uh, no, I can't do anything. I'll do it something later. Hmm? Forget it. It'll fly off. So, okay. It is important to have clean filtered cooling water to ensure clogging of passages do not occur. Material used for such complex cylinder heads is spheroidal, spheroidal graphite cast iron as it is relatively easy to cast. You see, cast steel is very difficult to cast. Cast iron is very easy to cast. So if the component is subject to lesser temperatures by providing cooling, why not use cast iron? Cast iron is also a little cheaper. So if it performs the function well, use spheroidal graphite cast iron with cooling bores cast while it is made. You don't always have to drill holes inside these passages for the cylinder head. But remember, cylinder head is not the only item which has got bore cooling. All right. Okay. So bore cooling is involved with all the components which make up the combustion chamber. Bore cooling is not involved in other parts of the engine where cooling is also required, but not at the temperatures that a combustion chamber suffers. A combustion chamber suffers a temperature of 350 degrees centigrade to 400 degrees centigrade. But a main bearing, a crosshead bearing, a bottom end bearing, they also need cooling. But they don't go above 65, 70 degrees temperature. So you don't need bore cooling over there. You need bore cooling only in combustion chamber components. And combustion chamber components are piston crown, the top part of the piston, cylinder liner, cylinder cover, part of the exhaust valve, and part of the fuel injector nozzle. That means the nozzle which is protruding into the combustion chamber. That also gets very hot. So you need bore cooling there also. Okay. Remember where bore cooling is used. It is used only in the components which form the combustion chamber wall. Okay. okay, let's move on. Any questions regarding what I've asked? Not about boilers now. Don't ask me questions about boilers. Paran, any questions on what I've just now explained to you? If you're not able to understand, ask. Sir, audio is getting disturbed. When did this happen? 248. Oh, that was a long time back. So safety valve has a switch. Karthik, is the audio clear now? Yes, sir. Now clear. Now clear. Oh, okay. 
ओके 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 लेट्स गो टू अ नेक्स्ट प्लेट अ नेक्स्ट प्लेट ओके कर्तव्य सिंह हैज अ क्वेश्चन सर इंस्टेड ऑफ फोर लार्ज डायमीटर इनलेट एंड आउटलेट वेल कैन वी यूज सिक्स रिलेटिवली less diameter valve as they will ensure high pressure flow no 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 six why not have 20 then do your work it becomes more complicated it becomes more messy so those angles also have to be considered okay that is why you can't have six valves now in a small engine like that with a diameter uh, you have six valves oh uh, that's the one four is the usual limit Uh, high high tech automobile automobile engineering where they have high tech engines six cylinder or fourteen cylinder V type BMW Maserati all those racing car engines those cylinder heads have at the maximum five valves now that I am telling you five valves Kartav we are saying tell me how many will be inlet and how many will be exhaust good question for you. previously you had four so very comfortably two were inlet two were exhaust now i will give you these high tech automobile engines they have five valves per cylinder head and they are specialist cars they are not for normal commercial use but they are used for racing and all that and uh, five valve so how many will be inlet and how many two inlet and three exhaust paran no You are wrong. It is opposite. Three inlet and two exhaust. But we'll come to that later now, because Kartavya Singh has set the ball rolling, and now the ball will start rolling very fast. Remember, Kartavya Singh, it cannot afford to be very complicated. If you have six valves, you need a rocker arm which is going to operate those six valves. Very complicated. You have to keep it simple. You have to keep it simple and highly efficient. So four valves. in diesel engines are the limit not more two are exhaust valve and two are inlet valve okay now i have another question but i don't want the answer now you give me the answer later others will keep dealing with that and i will not be able to progress with my powerpoint the question is if in an engine you have two valve which is normal two valves is normal the high performance valves have four valve high performance engines they have four valve now in a normal engine you have two valves all right obviously one will be inlet and one will be exhaust but one valve is bigger and one valve is smaller all right so we, now of course i have given you the hint so you will know the answer but one valve is bigger one valve is smaller which one will be bigger and which one will be smaller think of it and little later give me the answer others i will get absorbed in this let's see the next plate about bore cooling i hope you have understood four stroke engine bore cooling you see these passages that are shown they are very close to the surface of the combustion chamber and if you notice one more thing that two valves have cooling around the valves and two valves do not have cooling around their valves so the valves which have cooling around the valves are the exhaust valve because they are the ones that get hot and the inlet valve they don't get hot because the air which is coming in is almost 40 to 45 degrees centigrade which is nothing but the exhaust valve which are discharging the exhaust gases they are discharging at 300 plus so that is why the exhaust valve need bore cooling the inlet valve do not need bore cooling but the cylinder cover needs bore cooling because the exhaust is directly exposed onto the walls of the cylinder cover on the underside all right okay uh material use for that that's i've already explained to you so i think the diagram is explained to you all these bolts on the side they are all studs to hold the cylinder cover in place this cylinder cover has got 2 4 6 8 studs to hold the cover in place and these narrow passages are actually water passages which allow for cooling if you see the water comes right up to the fuel injector fuel injector is also bore cooled at the nozzle area so the nozzle area is the part that is exposed to the combustion chamber so it also requires some amount of bore cooling all right exhaust valve also is in the 
partly exposed into the combustion chamber. So it also has more cooling. Okay. The next one. Which is the next one? This one. Okay. This is the one. So that one is this one. Okay. Hey man, we have overshot the whole thing. Yeah. This is overshot. Sir, slide number eight. Slide number eight. Okay, yeah. So we have finished with this one. Next one is eight. Okay. Cylinder liner. Now we have finished with cylinder heads. Let us go on to cylinder liner. Now this is a very very important part of the engine. Why? Because it affects the pockets of the ship owner very severely. And you are the person who will be responsible if the ship owner gets bankrupt, if the ship owner makes a profit. Okay. Cylinder liner. These are generally made of cast iron and are a critical component in terms of cost to the ship owner. You see, the cylinder liner is a consumable part of the engine, much like piston rings, gaskets washers, rubber sleeves, these are all consumable items. Lubricating oil, fuel oil, grease, these are all consumable items. They get consumed. All right. And after they are consumed, you have to put new ones. But cylinder cover, entablature, tie rod, A-frame, bed plate, crankshaft, these are not consumable items. Bearing shells is a consumable item. All right. Nuts and bolts are sometimes considered consumable items because nuts and bolts, they get rusted over some time. So once you open it, we don't use them again. We use fresh nuts and bolts. So they are sometimes called consumable items. Sometimes where bolts are reused, they are not consumable items. But gaskets, yes. Rubber rings, yes. Seal rings, yes. These are consumable items. And they cost quite a packet. Very, very costly. Because that is where the company which manufactures engines make their profits. Remember, by making an engine very costly, nobody will buy that engine. So they make the engine and give it a minimal cost, minimum, almost no profit. But the parts which are consumable in that engine, they make the cost of that very high. And they know that if you run the engine, you will repeatedly buy those consumable items. And then they make profits from that. That is the strategy of selling an engine, a good engine, at low cost. If you make an engine with very high cost, it will not sell. So best is to make that engine at very high cost and sell it almost at pot price without any profit. The consumable, the filters, most of these engines sometimes use disposable filters. So that is the consumable item. And these filters cost a packet of money. So initially when you see the, piston, the engine is very cheap compared to the market, you buy it. And then you start paying money for replacing the consumable parts. So that is how a manufacturer makes the money. Okay. Now the cylinder liners, they are made of cast iron and they are consumable depending on how well you operate the engine. If you run the engines well with the correct parameters, with the correct purification of the fuel oil, filtration of the fuel oil, with the correct lubricating oil and the combustion temperatures, pressure, piston ring, all in good order, that cylinder liner will last a long, long time. All right. If you do not maintain these parameters, you will have a liner which wears down very, very quickly. And if it wears down very quickly, you will soon have to change it. The moment you change it, the ship owner pockets are empty to some extent because ship liners are very costly because they are very high, high quality cast iron. Next point. Cast iron is used, is close grained. That means the particles are very tight to each other. Otherwise, cast iron is not such a dense. The density of cast iron is much less 
than mild steel or cast steel or any of these high grade steel so you see check what is the density of cast iron is much lower because the particles are not packed in but for the cylinder liner it is specially made to have close grained particles in the cast iron and they are pearlitic gray cast iron with improved qualities like resistance to wear and corrosion all right this property of resistance to corrosion is achieved through use of chromium vanadium and molybdenum introduction into the cast iron that means when the cast iron is in the molten condition they mix vanadium molybdenum and chromium so this gives the property of resistance to wear down and at the same time resistance to oxidation it helps in reduce oxidation it means rusting it will not rust okay cast iron is used as a cylinder liner why because it provides a self lubricating property and this is a result of graphite presence in the cast iron what is graphite you see the pencil that point what you see for writing is not lead it is graphite if you rub this on a piece of paper you see how smoothly it runs but if you rub the wood part of it and you see how much resistance is there in its movement so graphite is actually a very fine lubricating medium in fact on on the ship we used to use graphite powder mixed with lube oil as grease that was a very good quality grease so wherever there was gear teeth running we used to put this graphite paste with lubricating oil and it provides excellent lubricating properties sometimes oil could not be used in some places because oil will fall drip off but this paste could be used very much like grease and it was found to be better than grease in some instances okay so remember these very important points one is it's very costly to make so that is why it is a very critical component for the ship owner all right and the cast iron which is used is used is given some treatment which gives it resistance to wear and corrosion okay or oxidation this is achieved by the presence of molybdenum vanadium and chromium all right so these three elements in the cast iron are put in when the cast iron is in the molten condition after it is in the molten condition it is poured into molds all right after it is poured into the molds it is given a spin so it is centrifugally cast so cylinder liners how are they close grained because they are centrifugally cast similarly piston rings are also centrifugally cast they get close grained cast iron and much better than ordinary cast iron if you simply pour it in the mold and let it have a casting so this is the difference between ordinary cast iron and cast iron that is used in cylinder liners and pistons okay next time when you go to the workshop check out a broken piece of piston ring you will see how solid it is it is not like an ordinary cast iron of course it's unlikely that you get a piece of the cylinder liner sometimes the cylinder liner is stronger than your mild steel so strong okay so this is an important plate for the cylinder liner and we can go on to our next plate remember cylinder liner material is a very special cast iron it is not ordinary cast iron and it is centrifugally cast and it has got some elements in it cylinder liners for big engines for large engines okay they are strictly cast iron and for the small engines sometimes they are chromium plated chromium plating gives it resistance to wear and resistance to corrosion also and it is only limited to small engines why because chromium is very very costly you cannot have a large cylinder liner 
chromium plated on the inside. It has to justify the cost of failure. It is cheaper to renew that other liner and put a similar liner than to put a chromium plated liner. It will cost the price of three liners. So the cost of failure has to be justified if you are going to put a chromium liner. All right. Okay. Why is cast iron used? Because it has graphite inside the material and this provides the last stage of lubrication between the rubbing surfaces. That means even if your lubricating oil between the ring and the liner fails, there is presence of graphite in the liner which helps in continuing the action without damaging for some time. So that is a big, big advantage in practice. So let's have a look at a little more of information on cylinder liner. What is the time? 15.26 already. 10 minutes more. So we can go up to plate 12 because that is the plate I have gone into with all the other sections also. So cylinder liner. The cylinder liner forms the cylindrical space in which the piston reciprocates, obviously. The reasons for manufacturing the cylinder liner separately from the cylinder block is as follows. Okay, never mind the reading. Let me tell you. The cylinder block function is not so demanding as much as the cylinder liner. So the cylinder block can be of a less costly cast iron material. So that is why the cylinder block is made from grey cast iron, ordinary cast iron. Because its function is only to hold the cylinder liner in place and take some amount of compressive load. And cast iron by itself is capable of taking a lot of compressive load. Any cast iron. Okay. And the other function of that uh, entablature or the jacket is to make a space between the liner and the jacket to allow cooling water to flow through. All right. So this diagram, what you see, is a conceptual diagram. In other words, it is not a real diagram of what actually exists. It's just to show you the concept of where the entablature is and where the liner is. How the liner is fitted in the entablature. You see the flange part of the liner is resting on the entablature. All right. And the lower part of the liner against the entablature as a sealing arrangement. So there are O-rings or rubber rings which are a consumable part of the engine. Every time you remove the cylinder liner, you will have to put new rubber rings over there. These rubber rings are special rubber rings. They are called neoprene rubber rings. These neoprene rubber rings are vulcanized rubber rings and they are capable of withstanding higher temperatures they are capable of withstanding oil contamination. They are capable of retaining their shape. That means their elasticity is much better than ordinary rubber. So all these properties are into this rubbering. The rubbering looks very simple. It looks black color or it can be red color. But they are about 50 times the cost of an ordinary rubbering. So each rubbering costs a lot of money. And they are from the original manufacturers. You can buy mm -hmm. local manufactured identical rubberings, possibly made in China. Mm -hmm. And those rubberings, <laughs> never mind, they are trouble. They are big trouble. And they will make you work five times more than what you do with normal original rubberings. So never take chances with locally purchased rubberings for cylinder liners. Only get OEM parts for your engine. That OEM, what does OEM? Original engine manufacturers or original equipment manufacturers can be both ways. Okay, the liner can be made of a superior material to the cylinder block. While the cylinder block is made from grey cast iron, the cylinder liner is manufactured from cast iron alloyed with chromium, vanadium, and molybdenum. Cast iron also contains graphite. 
which assists in lubrication. Whereas the alloying elements helps resist corrosion as well as improve wear resistance at the higher temperature. Always a material which is subject to high temperature is also okay. subject. <laughs> What, what? Somebody is saying something. There's a lot of garbled sound coming. I can't make out what. If you have a question, write it down. Paran Abdus has asked. What is meant by pearlitic gray? See, how do you describe this white paper? It is not just paper, it is white paper. Similarly, cast iron is normally gray. And this particular grade of cast iron, if the surface is exposed, if it is broken and exposed, you know. Pearl, you know what is pearl? The ladies use the earrings and necklace. It's got a shine about it. All right. That shine is there in particles of that gray cast iron. So that is why it is given a pearlitic gray cast iron name for that color that appears on the cast iron if it is broken. That means freshly exposed cast iron looks like pearlitic gray. It is gray, but it has got a little shine in it. And that shine comes from pearl. Okay? So that is why it is a description of the quality of cast iron. It is one of the lowest grades of cast iron. Pearl is not lowest. A low cast iron. It is not the high grade cast iron. Okay. Okay. Let's see the next item. Let's see the next item. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Keep your microphones off if you are not saying important to say because it's a disturbance. Hey, Kundan Kumar, you'll have to find out whose microphone is on because my. PowerPoint is on, so I can't make out whose microphone is on. Somebody's microphone is on and a lot of garbled sound is coming. So it's a bit of a disturbance. Okay. Okay, next page what we have is liners need to satisfy... Con Here is a very important plate. Liners need to satisfy conflicting requirements of being thick and strong to withstand high pressures and temperatures during combustion and thin enough to allow good heat transfer. Now let me explain this point. You pay full attention and don't make any sound right now. Now the cylinder liner, when the peak pressure happens, that is the maximum pressure that happens at the upper region. That maximum pressure is also with the maximum temperature. The peak temperature occurs in when the fire is there inside. And this occurs in the combustion belt of the liner, which is the uppermost part of the liner. And once the piston starts going down, then the pressure and temperature starts also going down. So the liner suffers the maximum pressure and temperature in what is called the combustion belt, the, the upper one-fifth or one-sixth of the liner. So this is the part of the liner that has to be made the strongest. So it all because the pressure inside subjects the walls to high forces and these forces are interpreted or translated into hoop stress. I, I, I hope you understand what is hoop stress. Hoop stress is circular stress on the cylinder liner walls. So that part of the liner has to be thick to take up the hoop stress arising out of the physical pressure inside the combustion belt at that point of time. But the temperature is also very high. So the walls of the, of the cylinder liner 
in the combustion belt at that combustion belt is the highest and if you make it very thick then the differential temperature or the temperature gradient will also become very high so if you make it very thick and the temperature on one side is very high there is every reason for that cylinder liner to crack so you need that liner to be thick to take the physical pressure and you need it to be thin so that there is no temperature gradient so both are completely con contradicting each other so how do you manage this so you make it thick so it can take the physical forces arising out of the gas pressure to take the circumferential hoop stress it can be taken now you drill holes through that thick part of the combustion belt through the liner as close as possible to the combustion wall all right so any heat which takes place on the surface of the wall is immediately removed by the cooling water so that material does not have a very high temperature differential and, and those holes are made right next to the combustion belt so that is how the conflicting requirement of thick and strong is also fulfilled and at the same time the temperature gradient is also eliminated and this is achieved by bore cooling so i have written bore cooling in yellow so it's like a definition so if you are asked the question what is bore cooling you can answer the question by bore cooling is an arrangement where engine components are cooled with a cooling medium and this may be water or oil which is passed through na narrow drilled or cast passages in close proximity to directly heated surfaces all right bore cooling is a cooling arrangement where the engine components the components which form the combustion chamber are cooled with a cooling medium that may be water or oil which is passed through narrow drilled passages in close proximity to the directly heated surfaces that means the holes are very close to the combustion walls and they pass cooling water okay i will show you a diagram just now with bore cooling this arrangement reduces thermal stresses that could arise in the component okay bore cool components are cylinder liner piston crowns cylinder heads fuel injectors and exhaust valves remember piston skirt does not have bore cooling only the crown the topmost part of the piston the side walls do not have bore cooling all right we will come to pistons when we describe piston and show you bore cooling so these are the five parts which form the combustion chamber and bore cooling is provided in them external or incomplete ribs are provided on some liner walls in two stroke engines to facilitate water circulation all around the liner now in the previous diagram we saw sorry not this one this one in this one we saw that this part is water cooled and the water enters through these bores and it goes into the uppermost part from there it goes into the cylinder cover all right now if the water enters over here it can simply go up pass through this bore and come out from there what about sending the water in this side because the inlet of water is from one side and the water has to go to the other side so what they do they build ribs the ribs are protrusions on the surface of the liner to direct the water onto the other side of the cylinder liner wall all right so uh, so where are we now yeah so this arrangement reduces uh, uh, external incomplete ribs are provided on some liner walls on two stroke engines to facilitate water circulation all around the liner other the water will enter from one side go up and go out other side needs to be cooled in four stroke engine liners ribs are provided at the combustion belt region to provide strength to resist hoop stress to make it simple the four stroke engine liner also needs to be cooled but it also needs to have the strength so at the upper region instead of making the liner wall thick they have put ribs on the external surface all right 
So time is already 15.40. Okay, next diagram is what I have made for your examination answering process. So this diagram is what you need to practice and be able to draw and explain. So this is the diagram which can be drawn by all of you. I don't expect you to draw the complicated diagram that I've shown you much earlier. So practice this diagram. And on the left, what you see is a two-stroke cylinder liner. On the floor is a, on the right side is a four-stroke cylinder liner. And these two diagrams are representative. They are not drawn to scale, but as close as possible to scale. And some of the items which are there may not be there in some liners. Some of the there which are not there in other liners are here in this liner. Now here we have only inlet ports and this inlet port I have shown only a few. It might extend all along the inlet side on that side. And if this has got only inlet port, it means this cylinder liner is made for an engine which has an exhaust valve. If it had both inlet and exhaust ports, then the exhaust valve issue does not arise. If the thicker part or the combustion belt part has been made thicker to take the physical forces arising out of hoop stress and they are also given bores or narrow passages which are drilled through the thick part and allowed for cooling of the liner to reduce thermal stress. At this region you see holes are provided that means from outside Lubricating oil is pumped to small little pumps for cylinder lubrication. And just inside the liner, what this view is, is inside the liner, you see there are grooves made at an angle to allow that oil to drain into those. So when the piston moves up and down, the piston ring will spread the oil on the entire surface. So these grooves are made for the oil to drain into and allow for maximum spread of oil on the liner walls for lubricating the piston link and liner. The four-stroke liner is similar, but you will notice there is no force because it's a four-stroke engine. And the ribs that you see on the outside are always at the upper region, which is the combustion area. So the maximum pressure suffered here is taken up by the extra strength provided by the ribs on the outside. Lower part, you have a thickened part where there are grooves which allow for rubber rings or O-rings to be fitted so that when it is introduced into the entablature, it makes contact with the entablature walls to provide for sealing. So the cooling water runs only in this space over here in the two-stroke and in this space for the four-stroke. You see the top of the plan, it has been recessed. If you see the plan view, this is what it will appear. This is intended for the valve when it is working to move into the cylinder and come up again. So the disc of the valve needs the space to come inside. So that is why a little bit of a groove or the recess is made to allow for valve operation without the edge of the valve hitting the flange of the liner. All right. So if you have any questions, ask, because this is now I'm going to put a stop to it. We have come up to page 12 or plate 12. This is the same we've come up with the other sections also. Okay. Any questions? You can write it down or you can ask. So remember, we will say full attendance today, 41. I think there's an extra boy who has come in from somewhere. Never mind. I have no issues. Today, all present, sir. Paran, thank you. I like that. That is a thumbs up from me to all of you. Okay. Very good. So that's all. Try to think over and answer those questions that I've given to you. Next question, last question. Think, why are the holes drilled at an angle? Sorry, not this one, this one. You see these holes are drilled. They are drilled at an angle. Why are they drilled at an angle? So do some thinking and next class, you have to answer me this question. All right. My throat is dry. <coughs> now I need to go and drink some water. Yes, what is it? Go ahead, ask. Sir, uh, we haven't got the recording of the class. Uh, like say, the first class only we got and after that we have not been able to get. So send recording. me individually one one email, not more than one. 
and I will immediately attach. Moment you send me the that uh, statement that this particular class I have not attended, I go on to that and it says share. Then I put on share, and then the, immediately the email address comes from your that particular cadet. So I put it on share, and it goes to that cadet. So each of you will have to send me one one email asking me to share, and I share it. I've done it previously for all other classes, and boys have done it. But do not send me more than one email because forty boys, I will get forty emails. I have to respond to all forty. So send only one email. Other section, one boy sent me twenty emails from the same lecture, and it flooded my email box. And all my official emails are coming, and they get messed up. So send only one one email, all of you, and I will respond to all of you. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Now I'm putting the shopping on the record. Okay, that stuff started.